Good evening, and welcome to the Frick Collection. Welcome as well to those joining us on Frick Fora channel, streaming live on our website. I'm Joseph Godla, Chief Conservator here at the Frick, and I'm pleased to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Kevin Berth, a professor at Queens College, City University of New York, and a specialist in historical conceptions of time. Tonight, he will be presenting in conjunction with the Precision and Splendor exhibition on view in the Portico Gallery through February 2nd of 2014. And I should mention that the gallery will remain open until 7.30 this evening. <clears throat> this exhibition presents the development of watch and clock making from the Renaissance to the 19th century in 19 pieces from the Winthrop Eady bequest and five clocks generously on loan from Horace Wood Brock. The installation represents some of the most innovative as well as politically and religiously charged moments in timekeeping over the last 500 years. It's a huge pleasure to have Dr. Berth here to provide a broader context and understanding of some of the pieces included in the exhibition. <clears throat> Dr. Berth earned his PhD in anthropology from the University of California in San Diego and, ser and has served on the Queens College anthropology faculty since 1993. He has published three books titled Any Time is Trinidad Time, Bacchanalian Sentiments, and Objects of Time, in addition to numerous articles. Dr. Burr's expertise includes the temporal construction of history, human circadian rhythms and globalization, medieval cock crow, and ethnographic methods of measuring time. His recent publication, Objects of Time, analyzes how time measuring mechanisms shape our thought processes. Tonight, Dr. Berth will relate several of the clocks in the exhibition to historic changes in timekeeping, including the Gregorian calendar and the Counter-Reformation, the Copernican Revolution, the transition from solar time to mean time, and the French Revolution's experiment with digital time, or decimal time, I should say. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Kevin Berth. Thank you. Uh, thank all of you for coming out tonight. And before I get started, there are a number of people I want to single out for thanks. Uh, first of all, uh, Charlotte Vignon um, for giving me access to these clocks to begin with. Uh, Adrian Lay for guiding me through the logistics of preparing this lecture. And Nicholas Wise for helping me get access to some of the files. Uh, Patrick King and Joe Godla have been invaluable in helping me compile the images and uh, giving me access to the clocks and they deserve a very special thanks tonight for agreeing to rotate the Weber masterpiece so we are able to see a side of it that has not been on display during the exhibit. Uh, I also want to thank my son, Brendan Berth, who has helped me with the Latin translation of the guide to the Easter tables on the Weit Schaufel clock. And lastly, uh, Breguet Watch Company for helping to sponsor this wonderful exhibit. Every clock tells a story. Every clock takes a position in a debate about time. Every clock is an attempt to shape how people think about time. But clocks are so taken for granted that we often have difficulty getting beyond the familiar to see the unusual in historic timepieces. Tonight, I'm going to engage in what one might call clock reading of some of the clocks in the Precision and Splendor exhibit. I'm going to do this to try and single out features of these clocks that are related to cultural, historical, and scientific debates about time and how time should be represented. And I'm going to try and highlight these features so that after the talk, we can all go into the gallery and see them for ourselves. I'm going to begin with a very common image in the history of timekeeping. This image 
here at the bottom. Any of you who've read books about the history of timekeeping or at, were at Will Andrews' talk last spring will recognize this as one of the great and early uh, portrayals of early clocks. But most of the time when you see this image, it's just the image at the bottom. It's not the text or what it's connected to at the top, which is a chime. This is from Henry of Suso's book, Orologium Sapientiae, which can be loosely translated as the timekeeper of wisdom. On this page, at the bottom, the last part of the text, what Henry says is, so the mercy of the Savior deigned to reveal this present little book in a vision when it was shown as a most beautiful clock decorated with the loveliest roses and a variety of well-sounding symbols which produce a sweet and heavenly sound and summon the hearts of all men up above. Well-sounding symbols like on the Pierre de Faubie clock. Indeed, clocks, when they were invented, were meant to be heard more than seen. The Weber masterpiece has nine dials. Of those dials, five are for setting the chimes. Indeed, the word clock comes from the German word for bell, glock. Only much later did people watch clocks, and that's when watches were invented. But Henry also says that the clock that appeared in his vision was also decorated with the most loveliest roses. Here's a nice portrayal of a flower from a book of prayer, and here you can see close-ups from the Weber masterpiece. So these decorations are not just features of Henry's vision. They're also features of illuminated books of hours and period clocks. If we consider the emphasis on sound and the association of bells with religious practice, we have to reconsider the simple narrative of clocks evolving out of sundials and instead have to consider these objects as devotional tools and that their progenitors are as much the beautiful books of hours produced in the Middle Ages as sundials and water clocks. In churches and cloisters, bells would be rung to signal the beginning and ending of the daily offices, the daily cycle of psalms and prayers. Indeed, the last bell of the day was signaled at the end of the Vespers office, and it was commonly used as a curfew bell in many towns. Recitation of these offices was part of the daily devotional practice of many lay people. Indeed, books of hours were printed in greater numbers than Bibles. For instance, the elector Maximilian I, who ruled Bavaria from 1597 to 1651, is often written about in terms of his prayer life and his devotional life. His biographer, Johann Vervaux, wrote that even in difficult times and under the pressure of business and demands, Maximilian devoted an hour to morning prayer in seclusion. The in seclusion is an interesting comment to make because it's revealing a private part of Maximilian's religious life for the public to read, for the public to know. This is something that clearly ran in the family. This is Maximilian's grandniece, Maria Anna of Austria, who chose to be portrayed with a prayer book in this portrait. This was a period where public portrayals of the private prayer lives of the rulers of the Catholic nations was important. But Maria Anna not only chose to be portrayed with a prayer book, she chose to be portrayed with an Augsburg masterpiece clock, much like the Weber masterpiece in the gallery. And just to draw another connection to the Frick, 
Her husband is well known to anyone who visits the Frick. There he is. So the clocks and the portraits in this museum go together in important ways. Maria Anna's choice to be portrayed with a prayer book and then with a clock suggests a connection between clocks and prayer, but the clocks themselves indicate connections beyond the decorations with flowers and the relationship of time and the liturgy of the hours. Among these connections are saints calendars. This is a saints calendar from a printed book of hours. And these are the saints calendars or parts of the saints calendars. The one on the, that has appear on the Veit Schaufel clock and on the Weber masterpiece. The clocks and calendars, the clocks had calendars of feast days, Catholic feast days. Unfortunately, because of the complexity of these clocks, these calendars have not been on display during the exhibit, but as I mentioned before, tonight we are able to see this side of the Weber masterpiece. The clocks also contain astrological dials. The top is from the Weit Schaufel, the bottom is from the Weber masterpiece. And again, these dials have not been on display, but tonight we'll be able to see them. Astrological dials not only were related to astrology in general, but were used for the determination of birth charts. When a baby was born, the alignment of the planets and the stars would be immediately charted in hopes of determining that child's future. So this is another dimension of these clocks of this particular period. Also, like some prayer books, some of these clocks could be used for the calculation of the date of Easter. Before the Gregorian calendar reform in 1582, the determination of Easter was relatively straightforward, and the Veit Schaufel clock has instructions for doing this on the side. On one side, there are instructions for using the golden number, and on the other side, instructions for using the dominical letter. The golden number refers to the 19-year cycle of the relationship of the solar year and the lunar year. Because the solar year is 365 and a quarter days long and the lunar year is 354 days long, they don't cycle exactly together, but they do have a pattern of repeating every 19 years. As a result, the calendar dates repeat every 19 years as well the, in relationship to the phase of the moon. Easter, according to the Nicene Council, was to be the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. So to, to determine Easter, one needed to know the equinox, the full moon, and the first Sunday after. Since there are only 19 years in a cycle relating the solar year to the lunar year, there are only 19 possible calendar dates for that first full moon after the spring equinox. If you knew what year you were in, which is what this would help you do, what year you were in in the cycle, then you would know which calendar date applied to the full moon. The dominical letters were used to determine what Sunday would be. There are seven of them. A through G. The first day of the year was always given the letter A. So if the first Tuesday of the year was, say, the letter C, then every Tuesday of the year would also be a letter C, unless it was a leap year. You could use these two things to determine when Easter Sunday would be, because the cycle of the Dominical letters was a 28-year cycle. So once again, if you knew the year you were in, you could map up what letter Easter Sunday would be from this particular dial. So to give an example, in 1553, which would be right there, Easter, in 1553, the golden number is 15. 
That means that the full moon to determine Easter would be April 1st. The dominical letter for Sunday in 1553 is the letter A. Now, if we go to the calendar on the Weitschaufel, you'll see the days, the dates have letters. So you go to April, you would go to April 1st, and you would realize that April 1st in 1553 had the letter G, which means that Easter would be April 2nd. This means of calculating Easter is fairly old. It dates back to the Venerable Bede in the 8th century, and the circular diagrams date back to at least the 11th century. But the Weitschaufel not only allows for the calculation of Easter, it also allows the conversion of Roman time reckoning to modern time reckoning. In our modern calendars, we count upwards from the first day of the month to the last day of the month. In the Roman calendar, one counted down from the first day of the month to the knowns, and then from the first day after the knowns to the ides, and then from the first day after the ides to the first of the month. In this, you can see the modern calendar dates in one ring, and you can see the Roman calendar dates in the next ring inside. So the calendar on the Weitschaufel allowed the easy conversion between these two ways of reckoning time. Between the saints' calendars, the liturgy of the hours, and the Easter tables, I've made the case that these early clocks were tools in religious practices. In the 16th century, it was not possible for an object to be religious without also being political. This was the height of the Reformation. And the Weitschaufel clock was made shortly after the ending of the second session of the Council of Trent, the Roman Catholic Church's response to the Reformation. What started the Reformation was Martin Luther's 95 Theses, a protest against abuses associated with the selling of indulgences to finance the rebuilding of St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. Indulgences were decrees by the church that shortened the stay of a sinner in purgatory. In the famous couplet of the Dominican Johann Tetzel, he said, as soon as a coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. The Weitschaufel is a Catholic clock because you'll notice, whoops, you'll notice that the dedication of St. The basilicas of St. Peter's and Paul's in Rome appears twice on the clock. So the cathedral that Luther was protesting the financing of through indulgences is on the Weitschaufel clock. There's something about the Council of Trent that seems to bring out clocks. These two figures were important players in the Council of Trent. Pope Paul III called the council and uh, Cristoforo Madruzzo was the Cardinal of Trent. And you'll notice in both of these portraits there are portrayals of clocks. Interestingly, there are not really much in the way of portrayals of clocks in the portraits of Protestant reformers. It seems to be a mostly Catholic thing in this period. The Weitschaufel shows politics in other ways. We can identify that the clock was made for Venice, and we can do this in three ways. First, there's the astrolabe, and all astrolabes are made for a specific latitude. The latitude for which this astrolabe was constructed is the latitude of Venice. Inside the clock, there's a table that gives latitudes of a variety of cities. This was to adjust a sundial that is also a part of this clock and can fold out. The median city on this table is Venice. And lastly, the top of the clock is adorned with a lion. The lion is the emblem of St. Mark, the patron saint of the city of Venice. So interpreting the politics behind this clock, one cannot can look at politics beyond the religious affiliation of the clock 
and look at this list of cities. One of the striking things about the list of cities is there are no French cities on this list. It's only Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, German, Austrian cities, Dutch cities, and Constantinople, which at the time was an Ottoman city. No French cities. The date of this clock is from a period when the Habsburgs, who ruled Spain and the Holy Roman Empire, were in conflict with France. France was trying to conquer, to take control over northern parts of Italy. So the lack of French cities on this particular clock is a very powerful statement of the political affiliation of whoever made this clock or whomever this clock was made for. The same idea of figuring out religious and political significance can be applied to Weber's masterpiece clock. It too has an astrolabe, but in 1653, when this clock was made, an astrolabe was making another statement. A feature of astrolabes is that they assume that the horizon is fixed and it's the stars that rotate around the Earth. By 1653, many scientists had accepted Copernicus's model that it was the Earth that revolved around the sun and that the Earth rotated on its axis. An astrolabe in 1653 is asserting the old model of the Earth at the center of the universe and the sun moving around the Earth as opposed to the Earth moving around the sun. This suggests that this clock as well is a Catholic clock. The Roman Catholic Church had contemned Copernicus's position and this was most famously so in the trial of Galileo over his advocacy of the Copernican model. But like the astrological dials that I pointed out earlier, an astrolabe also has an astrological function. An astrolabe allows the charting of the position of the stars at the moment of birth. And the advantage of an astrolabe is you know the position of those stars even in cloudy weather if it's attached to a clock. Weber's masterpiece, like the Weitschaufel, was made for a specific location. It nicely tells us the latitude for which it was constructed. There's really only one place of any significance on that particular latitude in Europe, and that is the Dachau Palace north of Munich. This palace was the summer residence of the rulers of Bavaria. And the summer residence during this period would have not only served um, as the residence during that season, but also a place of refuge whenever the plague struck the city of Munich. Like other royal courts at the time, the Bavarian court was international in its composition which meant it had to deal with the different ways in which hours were reckoned. We're used to there being 12 hours followed by 12 hours for a total of 24 hours a day. This form of reckoning, which is on the outer dial of this particular clock, is known as the French hours, and it's the form of time that we've adopted. But on the inside of this ring, you'll see this gold ring, this too has numbers, but the number one in the gold ring is there. It doesn't align with the number one on the outer ring. It does align with the number one that's in this black portion of the inside ring, which is divided between silver and black. The gold ring represents what were called Italian hours. Italian hours were reckoned from sunset, so one o'clock would be the first hour after the sun went down. The inside ring with the silver and black represents Nuremberg hours. The Nuremberg hours divided the hours according to daytime and nighttime. During the summer, there could be as many as 18 daylight hours and as few as six nighttime hours. So the number one there on the Nuremberg dial corresponds to one o'clock at night. 
The reason why these particular dials are associated with the calendar portion is for the Italian hours and the Nuremberg hours to work correctly. They needed to be adjusted by the calendar date. And the neat thing about the Nuremberg dial is this black portion is actually a shutter that will either increase or de decrease depending on the time of year. Since both the Veit Schaufel clock and the Weber masterpiece have saints calendars, we can learn something about the particular political and religious biases of each clock. Every day in the Catholic year has multiple saints. So choosing a saint for a day reflects a choice of a patron or a set of problems for which one seeks saintly help. And while there are many dates I could have compared on these two clocks for purposes of this talk, I'd pick these two. Bishop Valens was Bishop of Auxerre and was martyred with three boys. Uh, just as an aside, you'll notice that Bishop Valens is in a lighter script than these others. Uh, I surmise that the darker script was added at a later date by a later owner of the clock. St. Germanus was a 6th century bishop whose relics would be uh, carried through the streets of Paris during periods of crisis or plague. Uh, his reliquary disappeared during the French Revolution. These same dates on the Weber clock suggest an emphasis on the Holy Roman Empire. May 21st is Constantine the Great, who isn't even really a Catholic saint. And May 28th is William of Aquitaine, who was a member of Charlemagne's court. The Veit Schaufel clock, in fact, only has one monarch, and that monarch is in the Black Script, and that monarch is King Louis IX, the king who led the Crusades. The Weber clock has 11 monarchs on its saints calendar. There's another difference as well. The Veit Schaufel commemorates seven saints who are hermits or ascetics or contemplative figures, whereas the Weber clock commemorates 26 such saints. All in all, the Veit Schaufel seems to have a rather standard church calendar with some additions made in dark lettering. The Weber clock has a calendar biased towards monarchs and contemplative figures. This fits with the public portrayal of religious devotion that I began the talk with. A closer examination of the Weber clock reveals some other biases. These biases include Eligius, who is the patron saint of goldsmiths and clockmakers. Uh, Eligius appears on the saint styles twice. A number of these other saints that appear with great frequency on the Weber clock have to do with reproduction, child rearing, widow, being a wood, widow, it suggests a particular theme. Often these clocks are associated with an institution called the Kunstkammer, which is a collection of art and artifacts that would be found in many palaces. But this emphasis on women and reproduction and child rearing suggests that the clock may have been also closely associated with an institution called the Frauenzimmer. The Frauenzimmer was a wing of the court that could be politically strong, was usually religiously devout, and very concerned with matchmaking for both political and reproductive purposes. The period in which the Weber masterpiece was made adds weight to this. It was made shortly after Maximilian I had died, and his widow, Anna Maria, was the regent of Bavaria, since his son, Ferdinand Maria, was too young to rule effectively. 
Anna Maria was Maximilian's second wife. His beloved first wife, Elizabeth, died childless. So the themes of widowhood, child rearing, and reproduction that are a feature of the Weber masterpiece are also very much part of the Bavarian court at this moment in time. These masterpiece clocks were a major task to make. In the 1650s, for a clockmaker to be ranked as a master clockmaker in the Augsburg Guild, the clockmaker had to complete one of these clocks, and only one or two clockmakers were eligible to do so each year. At the time the Weber clock was made, the requirements for masterpiece clocks included that they should strike the quarter and the hour, they should have displays on all four sides, they should include a 24-hour dial, they should show the movement of the sun and moon through the zodiac, and the relationship of the seven planets to the hour of the day. They should include a calendar, an astrolabe, and they should also display the phase of the moon. In a study done by Bruce Chandler of the College of Staten Island and Claire Vincent of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, they revealed that these clocks required a lot of patronage and financing, that the clockmakers themselves had a difficult time affording the materials to make these clocks. The Weber masterpiece, because of the saint's calendar and the period in which it was made, suggests that it was made at the request of the Habsburgs for a Bavarian palace. Sometimes we learn about cultural difference and cultural change through comparison. The issues of debate reflected in the Weit Schaufel and the Weber clocks include France versus the Holy Roman Empire in Bavaria, the Reformation versus the Counter-Reformation, Copernicus versus Ptolemy, and the politics of the period after the Thirty Years' War. When we get to clocks from the Enlightenment, we find that there are different issues. Copernicus versus Ptolemy had been settled. The Holy Roman Empire wasn't what it had been, and these Enlightenment clocks tend to reveal debates about what time should be represented on the clock. Should it be solar time or mean time? This wasn't an issue before the 18th century because clocks were not precise enough nor did they run long enough to be able to notice the difference between apparent solar time and mean time. The difference is because the Earth is rotating as it revolves around the sun. This means that most days of the year, a 360 degree rotation of the Earth doesn't bring it back into a, the same alignment with the sun. So most days are a little bit shorter or a little bit longer than 24 hours. In fact, only four days a year are equal to 24 mean hours. In the 18th century, there was a debate over which of these two times should be displayed, solar time or mean time. In the late 18th century, there was a clock put on the Berlin Academy which had both solar hands and meantime hands, like the Rabin clock here, and the population insisted that the meantime hands be taken down because it was too confusing. There was a preference for solar time. On the Rabin clock, we can get a sense of this preference. When you look at the hands that match, it is the solar time minute hand that matches the hour hand, not the mean time minute hand. The mean time minute hand and the calendar hand and the seconds are in black. Solar time is in gold. It's almost as if this clockmaker was making a distinction between what was natural and what was humanly created. The difference between solar time and mean time is only a few seconds per day. 
But these seconds accumulate so that over the course of the year, apparent solar time can be as much as 16 minutes ahead of or behind mean time. And that's what the graph on the left represents. Trying to convert this graph into something that would tell time is a real challenge. But skilled clockmakers like Robin or Bertou, and there's a Bertou clock at the foot of the stairs, would accomplish this by taking the graph on the left and putting it on circular graph paper. When you do that, you get this kidney shape. This kidney shape would be converted into a cam here that would then adjust a lever that would then move the solar time hand either in front of or behind the mean time hand. This is the one of the mechanisms that Bertou used. Uh, it's possibly the mechanism that is behind the clock at the bottom of the stairs. But science by the 18th century required precise measurement of duration. Newton wrote, for the natural days are truly unequal, though they are commonly considered as equal and used for a measure of time. Astronomers correct this inequality that they may measure the celestial motions by a more accurate time. Thanks to Galileo, by this period, science increasingly involved mathematics coupled with observation. And this created a problem with regard to time. It's inconvenient to calculate time. 24 hours a day, 60 minutes an hour, 60 seconds a minute. It's easy to make mistakes. In the French Enlightenment, a case was made that decimal time would be a far better way to represent time. De Alembert, in the famous encyclopedia he co-edited with Diderot, made this argument. He suggested that a decimal division would render calculation much easier and more convenient, and it would be much preferable to the arbitrary division of the day into 24 hours and the hour into 60 minutes. The French Revolution passionately embraced the Enlightenment and sought to construct a rational time that had three features. One of these features is that would be devoid of spiritual references. This is quite different from the Weitschaufel or the Weber masterpiece. A second feature of French Revolution time was that it had to be rational in the measure of time. And a third feature is that it should reflect scientific knowledge. On September 19th, 1793, the Committee of Public Instruction began to consider a proposal for a new calendar. Along with the new calendar, there was a recommendation that the change also include a day with decimal divisions and subdivisions. 10 hours a day, 100 minutes an hour, 100 seconds a minute. The decree was approved on October 5th and became the official way of representing time in revolutionary France. This is Abraham Louise Breguet, Breguet's attempt to make a decimal clock. You can see it goes up to 10. While that looks like a six, it's really an upside down nine from our perspective. There's the number six, that too is upside down. It's unclear what Breguet's relationship to the creation of decimal time was. Because by the time that decimal time was made law, he had fled France. Breguet was a friend of Jean-Paul Marat, who was a pro-revolution populist journalist. 
Breguet actually saved Marat's life at one point, and legend has it that Marat's sister made watch hands for Breguet. On the other hand, Breguet was a clock and watchmaker for the royal family and the royal court. Indeed, his famous watch, number 160, which is called the Marie Antoinette, is considered the most valuable watch in the world. It was supposedly commissioned by one of Marie Antoinette's lovers, and it contained every function anybody could have dreamed up at the time to put on a watch. Not only had a clock, it had a perpetual calendar, a minute repeater, a thermometer, a chronograph, a power reserve, and a chime. And, you know, it's worth getting on the internet to look at it because it's just an amazing piece of work. But since Breguet made timepieces for the royal court, that made him come under suspicion with the revolutionary government. In the summer of 1793, Marat learned that Breguet's name had been placed on the list of suspicion. Shortly thereafter, Marat was murdered. Shortly after that, Breguet fled France. So this decimal timepiece was not made while Breguet was in France. By the time Breguet would return to Paris, French Revolutionary time, decimal time, had been repealed because nobody really liked it. Unlike other clockmakers making decimal timepieces, Breguet was not satisfied with a mere representation of decimal time. He wanted to create, as far as I can tell, a Copernican watch. The Earth rotates counterclockwise. Counterclockwise. In other words, your clocks run the opposite direction of the Earth's rotation. Basically, the clocks and watches that we're familiar with still hold on to a model of the universe with the Earth at the center and the stars and the sun revolving around the Earth a Ptolemaic representation. To make a Copernican clock, you would need to make the hours rotate counterclockwise, which is rather disconcerting. What Breguet did here was extremely innovative and absolutely didn't catch on. The way this watch or clock works is this outer dial, which has the minutes, is fixed. The next dial in, which has the hours, moves, and it moves with the hand. So the hand moves around the clock, indicating the minutes, and you'll see the minutes go up to 100. Every 10 minutes, this hour ring moves counterclockwise one notch. So the hour ring is, in fact, rotating in the same direction that the Earth rotates. And it does so using something called a retrograde movement, which Breguet pioneered at the same time, the same year that he made this particular clock. So try and imagine how this thing works. This hand moves around like that. This ring moves around like this, and then every 10 decimal minutes snaps back one notch. It's easy to think that we're much smarter now, that the debates about time have been settled, and that we just have watches with hours and minutes that we can all agree on. But nothing's changed and that these are some of the things that have happened to our time in recent time. Clocks remain sources of debate. Time remains something that there are disputes over. Our clocks and watches are no longer set to the rotation of the Earth. They're set to the weighted average of the periods of cesium-133 atoms and suites of what we call atomic clocks. There is no atomic clock that gives time for the world. It's an average of a whole bunch of them. That time gets to us through a variety of ways. And even as we speak, there's a very passionate debate 
over something called the leap second, which is what keeps our clocks and watches roughly in sync with the rotation of the Earth. The problem is, is that the leap second creates problems for many computer systems. So even as we sit here tonight, there's this debate going on. In fact, there was a major meeting a couple weeks ago about the leap second. And in 2015, the resolution to get rid of the leap second will come again before the international body that determines the time that's on your clock. I bet you didn't know there was an international body that does that. Indeed, there are several things going on as we speak that are debates about time, including should we get rid of the cesium standard and go to a rubidium standard? Should we get rid of the leap second? And which time is the best time to use? Atomic time, coordinated time, or time from GPS satellites? And once Galileo, the European system, gets up and running, I'm we can add another one to that. So the debates about time continue, just as with the Pierre de Faubie, the Weitschaufel, the Weber, those clocks all represent debates about time. So too do our clocks and watches represent debates about time. While clocks may look superficially alike, they differ in important ways. And if we can learn to read clocks from different periods, we can come to understand the different cultural, scientific, and sometimes religious debates that shape these clocks that we see and the glorious clocks that are in the precision and splendor exhibit. Thank you. Okay, there's some time left for questions, if anybody has any questions. Yes? Between atomic time, coordinated time, and GPS time. Okay. Um, atomic time is uh, calculated based on the uh, readings of atomic clocks spread throughout the world. These clocks then send their reports to the International Bureau of Weights and Measures in Paris that then uh, calculates what the ideal time should be based on a weighted average, based on which clocks seem to be performing the best. This then is turned into something called um, international atomic time, which only the BIPM keeps. It does, it's not broadcast internationally. Coordinated universal time, or UTC, which is what replaced Greenwich Mean Time, is what gets broadcast to the world. That's what many of our clocks and watches are set to. And that gets broadcast um, from agencies like the National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, or other national time laboratories throughout the world gets coordinated on computers through something called network time protocol, which is what keeps your computer synchronized to the internet. UTC is a um, representation of time that is coordinated with, currently coordinated with the rotation of the Earth. So if the time on our clocks gets 0.9 seconds off of the rotation of the Earth, then a leap second is inserted or deleted to keep the clocks in sync. Atomic time, in contrast, is just an integral count of seconds dating back to 1972. GPS time is the time kept by GPS satellites. Now, the GPS satellites, they've been up there for a while. They have their own atomic clocks in them, and those atomic clocks keep time signals and keep time and coordinate with one another. So your GPS device is getting its time from the satellites. Now, there are some people who prefer to use GPS time over the time that's disseminated from the International Bureau of Weights and Measures. And then there are some people who don't like universal coordinated time and would like to just go to an integral count of seconds known as atomic time, which the International Bureau of Weights and Measures doesn't really broadcast. And all this is going on. And your particular uh, clock or watch, you know, cell phone or uh, cable box or computer, 
uh, you possibly don't know what is determining the time on it. In fact, if you go into your computer settings, you can often have an option as to where you get your time signals from. And you might get your time signals from Microsoft, which probably isn't that great, or from Apple, which actually isn't that great either, or you could get NTP time or NIST time. Your computer, you can actually set up to get time from a particular source. And all this is going on, and we just don't pay any attention to it. But if you decide to go into your cell phone or your computer and desynchronize it, what you will discover is that in a few days, your cell phone or your computer is more and more seconds off of the rest of the world. Because computer clocks, the clocks in our computers, the clocks in our cell phones, aren't very good. adjustments or modifications affect the calendar or the, the year? Um, I know it anyway. Well, in 1582, there was a major adjustment that affected the calendar. Uh, by 1582, the uh, Gregorian, the Julian calendar, which had been imposed by Julius Caesar and adjusted by Augustus, was 10 days off. Now, this created a problem for Easter, because if Easter is the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox, and the church is decreeing the equinox is March 21st, I think it is, and your March 21st is 10 days off of the actual spring equinox, then it is actually possible, and they realize this, to have Easter before the spring equinox, or something of that sort. So that led to the Gregorian calendar reform of 1582, in which they for 1582 eliminated 10 days from that year to bring the calendar back in sync with the solar year. The rest of these things, what effect will they have on the calendar is a very good question. One of the bones of contention in the leap second debate is if we no longer couple our watches to the rotation of the earth, then what happens to the definition of the day? And the response is, well, in the near future, it really won't matter that much, and who's going to care 600 years from now anyway? That's one side. The other side is, well, we should care 600 years from now. Uh, so that's how the current policy debate affects the calendar. With regard to the clocks in the exhibit, the reason why the Weber masterpiece doesn't have an Easter table is it postdates the Gregorian reform. And the Gregorian reform, uh, the difference was such that it disrupted the ability to calculate Easter using the traditional tables. And the reason for that is under the Julian calendar, there's a leap year every four years. Under the Gregorian calendar, which is something that most of us don't need to care about because we won't live long enough to care, uh, it's a leap year every four years except for years divisible by 100 but not by 400. So we actually, whether you realize it or not, lived through a once in every 400 year event in 2000 because the year 2000, since it's divisible by 400, was a leap year. 2100 won't be a leap year, and 1900 wasn't a leap year. But because of that, you couldn't create these cycles like on the Weitschaufel clock that allow you to predict Easter forever and ever. Mass and velocity have any effect on recording of time or correlation <laughs> of times? Uh, I believe it was in the 1980s that the global time system officially started accounting for relativity. So part of what's going on in the current calculation of coordinated universal time by the International Bureau of Weights and Measures is it now taking into account the effects of relativity on the distribution of atomic clocks all over the globe? So that is part of the modern time architecture, which is what allows uh, modern timekeeping to get to the levels of precision that it can currently achieve, which is what allows for high frequency trading on Wall Street. <laughs> Everything gets connected in very strange ways. Uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, it's above my pay grade to decide. <laughs> uh, what caused all, 
all the furor of the year 2000 and everything was going to get messed up. Oh, okay. Uh, what caused that? Uh, and that's a, you know, another good example of you know, things being designed into clocks that then have all sorts of funny repercussions on how we have to think. What it has to do is most computer clocks built in the 70s and 80s were either 16-bit or 32-bit at most. And there's only so much time information you can encode in that. Our current computers are 64-bit or even greater, and you can encode a lot more time information in that length of uh, code than you can in a 16-bit machine. So the way that the 16-bit machines dealt with time is took a shortcut, where the year 2000 was the same as the year 1900. That may not sound like a big deal, but computers rely on something called timestamps to work. Uh, timestamps help uh, instruct the computer what should be done when. Every document you create, every program that's run creates timestamps. Timestamps are necessary for the high frequency trading. Timestamps are necessary to keep the airplanes from running into each other. All sorts of things depend on timestamps. So if you have timestamps that are outside of the range of what is expected. In other words, if a computer is expecting a timestamp for January 1st, 2000, and it gets a timestamp for January 1st, 1900, that computer just goes nuts. And the way it goes nuts is it keeps on going, are you sure that's what you think the time is? Are you sure that's what you think the time is? And then what happens if the computer does that enough, if it generates enough of a loop, it starts generating heat. When it starts generating the heat, either it melts down or the circuit breakers kick in to protect the computer. That's a smarter way to go. So that was the Y2K problem, is it was a problem of timestamps and the amount of time and date information that could be encoded in a 16 or even 8-bit machine that were still running in the year 2000 and then possibly would start generating timestamps that other computers wouldn't accept and it would create all sorts of problems. This is not the only time that we face this problem. GPS, I think, runs out of time in 2038. It has the same sort of timestamp issue because the GPS satellites were sent up mostly in the 1980s. So they have shorter bits than uh, modern timekeeping typically. So I think it's 2038 that GPS time rolls over and creates its own sort of parallel Y2K problem. And every time we insert a leap second, it creates a parallel Y2K problem because computers that do not properly insert the leap second start issuing timestamps that other computers won't accept. Okay, if you're updating your computer software, is it doing that? Um, yes. When a leap second is announced, chances are among the updates you will receive will be a patch to deal with the leap second. Um, but, you know, it's, in, in an interesting way, it's the same sort of problem that you see on the Weber masterpiece, and that is how do you convert between different types of time? You know, the Weber masterpiece with the dial with the Italian hours and the Nuremberg hours and the French hours, you know, is how do you reconcile different ways of thinking about time from different places in a way that makes sense to everybody? And timestamps are part of that architecture. Okay, there's a... Hi. Out of all of the research that you've done within the past couple of years, um, what would you say would have been your most profound finding or the most shocking or maybe even the most stupid thing you thought someone did uh, um, <laughs> in terms of time? Uh, most interesting, profound, stupid, or shocking. Um, there, there are lots of stupid things about time. Um, many, many stupid things about time. One of the dumbest things about time is the notion of the 24-7 society. And the reason why I say that's a dumb idea is we're still uh, diurnal mammals. Whatever we do to our clocks, we are still biological organisms. 
and our bodies are attuned to cycles of daylight and darkness and don't treat every hour the same, even though we're increasingly building a society that does treat every hour as if it were the same and sometimes leads to really bizarre behavior. I've heard tales of traders who will set their alarm clocks to wake up at the opening and closing bell of each major exchange throughout the world, which basically means they get no more than about three hours of sleep at any given time. That creates a condition called chronic sleep restriction. Studies of chronic sleep restriction shows that they impair memory function and cognitive function. So if you just extrapolate from that, that means that there's this population in charge of the global financial system that is doing brain damage to itself. And I think that's pretty stupid. Um, now, taking that idea and applying it to some of the practices in our schooling, how we're treating our children, where we're thinking the more homework, the more educated they'll be so that they start compromising on their sleep. That's the same thing, we're brain damaging our children. I think that's pretty stupid as well. Uh, so those are surprising, um, stupid things. Some of the interesting things that I've learned is, uh, you know, looking at roosters crowing in the Middle Ages, that before the advent of the modern clock, a lot of timekeeping was contextual and you would actually pay attention to something different at different times of day. So before sunrise, you would pay attention to roosters. Uh, at other times of day, you might pay attention to the cycle of bells or the movement of people or the shadows or flowers blooming at a particular time of day. And I find that very, very intriguing that there are many societies throughout the world and throughout human history that do use that sort of timekeeping rather than our sort of uniform every hour is the same. And probably the most surprising revelation related to that was realizing that in terms of human history, we're the weird society. That our clocks are the culturally unique device, the way of thinking about time that no other culture conceptualized. We're the exotic ones, not our ancestors, not all those societies that don't use clocks. We're the weird ones. <laughs> uh, I think it would be foolish not to see Dennis at the Open Gallery and, uh, and we don't ask uh, Dr. Bruce uh, additional questions out here. And I think we should all um, um, give, give Dr. Bruce a, a, a warm Thank you.